welcome everybody to the next session. We're very happy to have a radio community and it's titled Mysterious Models and Many Management Problems. Thank you very much and, and good morning. Um, I was tempted to with repeat in Gavin's footnote saying I'm also not a philosopher. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a physicist by training, um, involved heavily, as you may have guessed, in the IPCC reports, and sort of trying to make sense of all the world results that we have. So this is the perspective of someone who doesn't do real world development, but works a lot with models and tries to make sense of them. So um, we build models and we run those models, and this is how a model would look like on a 2D3 resolution in the atmosphere. Um, just to be clear to Lenny, it was the underground that you see the satellite product, so the that's not model generated, but the white is a model generated file distribution and so the bluish would be rainfall. And as we go along, we make those models more complicated and we make them better. And um, we're now at the stage where we can run models at sort of 12 kilometer resolution, not for hundreds of years, but um, there's a, sometimes a tendency um, or a temptation to think that they sort of converge to reality if we make them more complicated or complex enough. And if we increase resolution forever and forever, then at some point they will be predicting everything. And indeed, there are many things like look fine, and, and I do think models are useful for many purposes. I'm not just suggesting that models are completely useless, but there is at some point um, sort of this feeling of the brick wall that you're hitting, or you could say it's a series of larger and smaller yikes, as Lindbergh called them. And I'm going to try to. Um, Say a few things of where these where these uh, symptoms of hitting the wall may be, and it's um, one of them is that the fact that the uncertainties in the projections, if you just look at how the models predict the end of the century, are not decreasing. Despite years and years of more development and more supercomputing, they're essentially not changing much. Um, the criteria that we use to decide which model is good or bad are essentially unclear. We have ensembles of models, so we have like 50 models out there, um, and we don't really know what those ensembles mean. What the, those ensembles mean? Um, models are too slow; they produce too much data. That's a technical a brick wall. They're too complex to understand. We get to the point where it's really hard to understand what happens in the model because there's so many things. And as some people have made the point, that sometimes the results are maybe of limited value or we don't provide enough guidance to the user of how they are using it. And I want to illustrate this with a slide that I copied from Rob Lampert, um, hopefully with permission, and it's not a criticism, <laughs> it's not a criticism on his work. In fact, I, I think he's one of the few people who does this sort of interface work between the client modeling and the impacts and adaptation. But uh, what struck me was that he was making the point that we should do the best available science here. And, and that was from a paper coming out this year, and it had a table of models, and at the very bottom there was PCM1. So for those familiar with uh, how models are labeled, this is the model that was first published in 2000, uh, which refers back in that paper to components in sort of 97, and those papers refer back to uh, parts of the model developed sort of 20 years back. So part of that, what goes into that study is sort of knowledge of 20 years back, and Computing has increased by about a million in 20 years, just as a net comparison. So the question is, why did they use those models um, or not? And there's um, a few possible reasons for the choices or the lack of choices that they made. Uh, one, one explanation is they used whatever model was available. And they didn't think much about model evaluation or, or, or they didn't even have the information about it. And that's actually quite common. You use whatever model is out there. The second is you don't really know what matters for a model to be good or bad, so you don't know what criteria to use to judge um, model adequacy, and that goes back to what Lenny was talking a lot about. The third possibility is um, you think model uncertainty in the climate is irrelevant because it's dominated by uncertainty in the impacts, which Rob said is not the case in this, in this uh, particular study. Or maybe we have a problem in communication or, or sort of a gap between those producing those model results and those actually using them that we don't communicate clearly, we don't provide enough guidance and so on. 
So essentially, um, we treat almost all models the same, and, and the question is, why is that the case? About seven years back or so, I wrote an article titled The End of Mold Democracy? Question mark. And we had a workshop uh, in Boulder about assessing and combining multi-model climate projections, which is essentially trying to make a step forward beyond the model democracy question. But if you look at the KIPS assessment report, um, here we are again. This is what we call the postage stamp figure. Um, in, in all but one single case, and that's the sea ice, essentially all models were used for the assessment because we didn't quite know how to make choices in those models. So why is it that hard? So we we're going to talk in the first part about model evaluation and scalability. This is one of the famous figures often shown. It's, uh, it's the beauty contest of the models. It's basically showing for a number of variables on the vertical and a number of models here, um, how well they do relative to each other. Red meaning poorer and blue meaning better. So you can see that um, a number of things. First of all, there's some models that tend to be good at most things, and a number of models like PCM, which we had before, which tend to be poor on most things. So there is probably a case to be made that some models are better than others in general. But there's also a, a clear that some models do well on some things, and, but not on other things. So uh, model evaluation should probably be specific to certain criteria. Um, the third point is that we can measure those things with regard to observations, um, and we call this a performance metric. It's simply some sort of root mean square difference between the model and the observations. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the model is skillful for doing anything. The model could be right for the wrong reason. So um, what we need to do is we need to make some connection between the model performance and anything we can measure uh, to what we call the model quality metric, whether the model is useful for a specific purpose, which is something that is about the future where we don't have observation. <coughs> so the question is, can we aggregate that in a sense? Um, can, we, can we say, well, this particular model, because it has more blue, is, is better than another one? And you can do that, of course. Uh, here's a study that we did based on three different generations of models, going to two, three, and five, or forward in time. And basically looking at surface temperature and precipitation plus the seasonal side for the variability. Um, and the bars are, the higher, the longer the bar, the worse it is. So um, ideally it would be at zero. And you can see a number of things that are interesting here. First of all, um, we seem to be making progress in the sense that the, the bars are getting smaller as we converge uh, to today, but not very quickly. So it goes from like 1.5 to about 1.2 to 0.9 or so. So it's about 20% better every five years. But it's not going very quickly. The second thing you see is that there's a massive spread between the, the best and the worst. Um, at least a factor of two. And some models like HATCM3, which you're complaining about, Lenny, uh, they, they were developed 20 years ago. They, were still, they would still be competitive compared to today's models. <coughs> so there's, there's some models that are quite old that are still reasonably okay. And the interesting question is that uh, I, I was asked to give a talk at NCAR a few years back at the Breckenridge meeting, at their annual meeting, and I proposed the title, um, is TESM, the NCAR model, the best climate model? Question mark. <laughs> and then the organizer of the committee came to me and said, well, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure this is an appropriate time. <laughs> you know, the funding agencies and the program managers and so on. And I said, <laughs> I insisted on giving a talk with that title. <laughs> of course, um, you can define an infinite number of metrics. And, and many metrics are going to be very heavily dependent. So if you look at wind or surface pressure or fiber detector Pascal height, um, they're all going to be telling you the same thing. Observations, in some cases, are uncertain. But the most important thing is that this concept of a best model is completely ill-defined. And that goes uh, back to when Farkas work, which, which I really I think is, is extremely clear about this idea that there may be a best model for a particular purpose where best is measured in some specific way. But you have to talk about what the purpose is and how you mean best 
and determining that may be actually quite tough. And the analogy here would be like, if you ask the question, what is the best car? Then um, maybe this is the best car for impressing your girlfriend. Uh, if you want to get up the mountain, this may be the best car. And there's really no point in arguing which car is better. It depends on what you want to do. And I think that's really important that this community tries to uh, embrace that a bit more and the climate community. And I don't quite understand why the modeling centers are still insisting on creating one model that is best for everything. Um, there may be discussions happening internally of what means best and how this is judged, um, but it's rarely sort of made clear what the purpose is. You try to have one model for all purposes that is best for all purposes. So what we try to do is we, we have a model that simulates a present day temperature and it simulates something in the future. And there's other models that simulate the present day and the future. And we try to make some sort of inference of what the biases in the present day, here in the middle, imply for the future. So we're trying to make sense of, of whether a model that is too warm in one particular area is too warm in the future or, or not. And, and there's sort of three ways we can do this idea of model evaluation. And one of them is we simply do this beauty contest. We say smaller biases are better. So the smaller the magnitude in this temperature bias, the better. And we simply don't worry why. Um, a somewhat smarter idea is what we now call these emergent constraints. And it's essentially relationships between observables and predictions. So for instance, it's, uh, they're very clear in those models that the models that have stronger sea ice loss over the past, they tend to have stronger sea ice loss in the future. So if these things are heavily correlated across all the models, then maybe we can use the past performance on sea ice loss to infer something about the likely range in the future. There's other examples about albedo, um, there's other examples about the carbon cycle where the intraannual variability is correlated to long-term trends and so on. So we try to infer specific things that we can observe that relate in a clear way to the future. Um, and the third way of doing this model evaluation is, is through sort of process understanding and evaluation, and I will get to that uh, in a minute, what I mean by that. The reason why I'm worried about this is because it does matter. Once you start assessing weights and performance to those models, and people have done that, you can do, for instance, um, PDFs of temperature changes in Southeast Asia by the end of the century. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, the raw histogram is in gray here simulate three models, and the colored curves are three different estimates of probability, what they call probability, um, based on exactly the same models. So they're using exactly the same inputs, but they're weighting the models by different criteria. And of course, this, this graph is rather worrying, um, because it means that our inferred probabilities are completely unstable or uncertain based on the assumptions that we make. So it's about priors, it's about whether you weigh by trends or by mean state, and it relates to how you interpret the, the ensemble as a whole. Is it sort of uh, truth plus error centered, or are they exchangeable, or whatever? There's lots of things that matter. Um, and we need to understand better why people come to different conclusions based on different criteria that they apply for, for those models. So if Rob were to use a subset of models or a distribution, Based on these are the exact same models that are used, uh, at least the subset of them. Um, you could say, well, I'm going to use your PDF because that's a better estimate because it weights the model, but which one would you use? So, why is it so hard? Um, this is the forecast of the weather uh, today that I took from the website yesterday and said it should be clear. I'm not sure whether that means sunny or just uh, not raining. Um, um, but it turns out to be probably okay. Why do you believe that forecast? Not because we understand what the model is doing. I mean, there's probably two or three people in this room who do understand what the model is doing. But the answer why you believe it is something like 10,000, because that's probably the number of forecasts that were made by that model and then evaluated on the next step. So you believe or you trust the model to some extent, at least for tomorrow, maybe for the day after tomorrow, but not more than that, because you know that it has worked. 
So skill or confidence <coughs> in a prediction in this case is established by repeated verification, which is uh, a nice situation to be in. And you can discuss about how you define skill, but at least it's clear that it has something to verify it. And in the climate case, and that goes back to also to Lenny's talk, I think we're more in a situation <coughs> like that. Actually, the analogy gets gets worse and worse because we keep sending more of those to Mars <laughs> as we go forward. Um, but when they sent the first rover to Mars, how did they establish confidence that this thing would work? Because no one has ever been there. Right? There was absolutely no way of verification. So what did they do? Well, they built a huge pile of sand, and they drove it over the sand, and they put it in the oven, and they put it in the freezer because it could be hot or it could be cold up there. And so they were sort of thinking about relevant tests that could tell us something about that performance of that thing in a situation that has never occurred before. Because we're going into completely unknown territory, we need to come up with different ways of testing. And the question, what should these tests actually be? And there's always sort of the chance of the unknown unknown happening that <laughs> something may be in your way that you haven't thought about. <laughs> So the argument, um, we look at mostly evaluations of the from a statistical point of view, but um, I'm trying to write a book chapter for sort of a halfway philosophy book that um, is, is sort of trying to appear. Uh, I was thinking about this, this, uh, this idea of process understanding and, and, um, and why we believe models or results of models. And, and it's this may be the most philosophical sentence that I've ever written because I've thought very hard about it. Um, and I think my argument is that we, what we try to confirm is that for a particular purpose, first, the relevant quantitative relationships or interactions between the different parts or variables that emerge from the initial structure of the model are sufficiently similar to those in the target system. So that means we, have, we make an argument about the structure of the things. And we make an argument that all the things that are relevant for one purpose are dead. So if I need clouds, then the clouds must be there somehow. Um, the relationships are there, so the relevant things are described. It doesn't mean that they're actually similar. They could also be parameterized in some way. Right? We could describe photosynthesis in an aggregated way rather than in a chemical way. That's fine, but the relationship must be there. And then um, that these relationships must be sort of sufficiently similar. They're not, going be, they're not going to be perfect, but similar. And the question what is sufficient, of course. And then the second part of the argument is that we argue that these relationships will be sort of remaining over time and beyond the range where we can verify them or test them. Um, so nothing sort of terrible happens that we didn't expect before, like rappelling down into the shaft and getting the ball. Um, and no important part or interaction, either known or unknown, is missing. So we, we hope that we, we haven't missed it. And I think intuitively we all work that way, that we trust those parts of the model or the results of the model most where we actually do understand the reasons why it occurs. So we know that all of the basic physical processes are really well represented in those models, and that's why we have hope. It's not because all the models are good. So what does that mean in a in sort of more schematic sense? Um, here's a weather situation. It's actually the, the view of the cloud from my office. If you haven't been in Zurich, you should visit. It's a great place to be. Um, what we're trying to do is we build a model which has some parts and some interactions, and we hope that all of the relevant parts and interactions are there. And then we um, run that model forward in time. And notice that the model is not uncertain. I think this is one of the things I've learned from discussions with others in IPCC. This idea of model uncertainty is a bit strange because the model is completely certain. Once you've specified it, once you've written it down, it's completely certain. And it's completely deterministic. If you run it twice on the same computer, it will give you exactly the same result. What is uncertain is the relationship between the model and the other. So what we're trying to do is we, we make some sort of abstraction step into the model world, and then we make some what I call inference step. I'm not sure whether this is philosophically the right word. And we try to infer something back from those results from the, to the real world. Um, 
And that's the thing that is uncertain. How do we translate the thing we learn about the model into the reality? And how does that depend on the simplification we have made in building them? So model evaluation can be one of three things. It can either be like a statistical thing, it looks good, right? Sim temperature simulated, fine, it looks good. Um, or you could argue that this process <coughs> point, is, point of view is most important. The right things happen, there's the right things in it, the right processes in it. Or you can look at this sort of emerging constraints and what that means is, for instance, in this weather case, um, you could say the model predicts the next day's weather and it also predicts climate change a century ahead. Um, and reality tells me only about the next day, but they're not, not the end of the century. But if there is a strong relationship between those two, if you think the same processes operate for the next day weather and climate change, then maybe uh, the relationship between the short term and the long term can be used as sort of inferring uh, something about the world. Okay. Um, so this is the animated way of it. Um, this is again the, the view of the office uh, to, to the cloud. So here's the cloud, here's the ground, and so on. In, in a coarse resolution, Situation, and you can argue that's not good enough. So you, let's make it finer. Um, this is a, a high-resolution version. Here's a, a tower, but it, it's still a bit coarse. But the point is, no matter how good you are and how powerful your computer is, if you actually look at the reality and just watch the clouds moving, then you realize that no model, however complicated you make it, and no computer, however big it is, is going to ever resolve these things. Um, even at the end of the century, we will not be able to describe all of those scales that happen. I mean, it's, it's really beautiful, but it's also sometimes a bit scary. If you think about <laughs> the fact that our models have a resolution of 100 kilometers, and, and this is the front coming towards my window, then we, well, we were missing quite a bit. Okay, part two is about sort of model dependence. Um, people talk a lot about model evaluation and when, which model is good. But very few people make sense of the ensemble as a whole. And I took this from Paul Edwards' uh, article. It shows basically how models have evolved over time. And different groups have taken different codes from other groups as we go along. And so the models that we have today are rarely built from scratch. They're based on the earlier models. And you can actually show that by um, an interesting statistical analysis. And that works like this. It, it looks a bit scary. It, I call it the family tree of the models. You take the output of all the climate models that we have, and you create a distance matrix, <coughs> pairwise distances, and you simply do some sort of cluster analysis to say which ones are similar in terms of their output. So you don't know what's going in the model. You simply look at the simulated climate. And then you see there's sort of clusters of models that appear to be close in some sense, whatever metric you define. And close means, for instance, here's a family of NCAR models starting with CCSM 3, 4, CSM 1. And you can see that NCAR itself has about six or so models. The Norwegians have taken that model and changed it a bit. They call it the Norwegian model, but in fact, it's the same. And there's a couple of Chinese models which are taking versions of that model. So in the end, we have 50 models, but about 12 or so are the same, almost the same. Right? They're all based on the same code, the same assumptions, the same simplification. Uh, the Hadley Center is the same. And it's interesting that even Hadley 3 is 20 years old, and that is even close to the newest Hadley Center version. So either, either they have some stuff in the new model that is still the same as in the old one, or there is a sociological component that they care about the same thing. They tune the model in the same way. But uh, the reality is, of course, we have a family of models, um, and not all of those models are independent. And the other result was from a, a study that we looked at when they perturb parameters in the, in the Hadley Center model. These are the red ones here. You can perturb the parameters no matter how crazy you want. Um, you, all, the, you always will get some sort of Hadley Center model. So um, you can probably never get the structural uncertainty by perturbing parameters in a single model. But essentially, that means that the interpretation of those ensembles is very complicated. You don't have 50 models, and they're not all independent, but you do have sort of families of models. So how can we um, move forward? This is work by um, Ben Sanderson that we did. Um, 
And it's, it's a bit complicated, but I'll try to walk you through it. This is essentially showing the, the space of models. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's called multidimensional scaling. But for those interested, it's essentially trying to map out the model distances in a 2D field. Um, the observations are here in, in the circle. And the distances, they correspond as closely as possible to the, these distances that we had before. And you can see, for instance, here's the, here's the cloud of, uh, of happy center models, the, the, the brownish ones here. Here's the cloud of GFDL models in Princeton, the blue ones here. Um, here's GIS for Gavin, if he's here, no, he's not here. Um, here's NCAR, the red ones, and you can very closely see the clusters of models that are similar. Now, if you take those models as they are, you're going to be biased to those which are sort of overrepresented in those clusters. So what you're trying to do is you come up with a way of either eliminating that the ones are, that are duplicate, or you sort of um, try to interpolate in that space, sort of renormalize out that total similarity thing. And what you'd like to have is uh, essentially two things. If you duplicate the model, it shouldn't matter. And that would be the case if you average over that space. If you put this, the same model on top of each other, it wouldn't change the landscape. And the second thing that should happen if you have an infinitely bad model, it should be not counting too much. So you can sort of start to downweight as we go away from observation. So if you, if you start weighting by the distance to observations, then the ones that are sort of closer to the reality they get a bit more weight, and the ones that are far outside, one of the Chinese here, they get less weight. So this would be one sort of conceptual way of trying to um, um, trying to eliminate these multiple dependencies because the ones that are dependent are going to be on top of each other, and also take into account the ones that, that, that some are better than others. If it's too hard, I'll try to explain it in the brain. But what the, the, can I just yeah. ask, what are the two dimensions by which that map is produced? It's essentially, you could say it's the first and the second DOF of that distance okay. matrix. It's called multi-dimensional scale. So if you, if you had, the analogy is if you had a, a matrix of distances between cities, as you have sometimes in, on, on maps, then that would be the map that results from that analysis. But if you're confused, I think this is the example again. Um, if you're trying to predict the weather for tomorrow, you can look at the weather forecast, uh, a single realization from one model. And then there maybe there's another one from the same. You could also ask the farmer next door about the weather, or you could simply look at the sky. So these are sort of the four lines of evidence, the four models that we have. And now, um, first of all, it's unclear what the meaning of an average is. So averaging models may create something that is unphysical. Second, you have to worry about skill. You may trust the model more than the farmer, or the opposite way. But you have to, it's not clear that all are equal. So the democracy is not obvious. You have to worry about dependence. The fact that these are two runs from the exact same model doesn't necessarily mean that you give it twice the weight. If you read the newspaper for the weather forecast, you would not go and buy another copy of the same newspaper and think that this is providing more information. <laughs> and the final thing uh, is that you need to be worried about uh, the range of things covered. Of course, if no model has uh, a tornado, then no matter how you start waiting, you're not going to get the tornado. So that's sort of the unknown, unknown thing there. Um, Third edit topic is the variability. Um, a few years back, two or three years back, there was a there was a news piece written by Richard Kerr in Science about about defining the diameter of storm drain pipes in Seattle um, and basically how should those decisions be made. And it went on and on about um, uncertainties in here in the regional model, and then there's the global model uncertainties at the regional scale, which we can regional model that's one for two pages. There was no single discussion of natural variability. Now we've done some work with uh, Clara Desser and, and others at NCAR using large ensembles of the same model. If you run a model 40 times and then you take the average, this is the average of 40 models, you see the familiar pattern of warm warming in a highlight. But if you just take the warmest and the coldest realization of that model, um, these are quite different. 
And if you look at trends, for instance, um, here's Seattle. Right? So the coldest run has essentially no warming. And that's not over a few years, but it's, it's a 50 year trend. So no warming over 50 years. And the warmest one has a warming of about 40 years. And this is not modeled on surface. This is exactly the same model, the same scenario. The only thing that has changed is a tiny, tiny perturbation here in the butterfly. So that means on the local scale, variability can be pretty large. It's not large on a global scale, actually. Right? On a global, they're all the same. But because circulation changes, um, these things can, can matter. Now, if you look at rainfall in Seattle, for instance, you could have 20% more rainfall or 20% less rainfall. That's what I'm about mean rainfall. Now, I'm not sure what happens with extreme rainfall. Maybe that's better explained. Um, but probably, if you decide about the storm drain type diameter in Seattle, you happen to be in a place where the uncertainty in models and the uncertainty in scenarios is basically swamped by uncertainty in actual reality. And people, I don't think, have appreciated that enough because they were focusing on sort of global mean temperature by the end of the century. But once we talk about adaptation, 20 years, 30 years, and we talk about local changes, then the natural variability is very large. And it's almost irreducible unless we make tremendous progress in the table forecast. Uh, we, we, we probably see this as a, a lower bound on uncertainty that we could not um, overcome. So what are the latest models predicting or projecting for the future? And that relates to the, the, the hitting the wall on the uncertainty is not decreasing. If you want the old generation of models for the old scenarios, um, this is how it looks. And these are the new ones. Um, it's a bit difficult to interpret because it's, it's not really good scientific practice if you change the models and the scenarios at the same time. Um, so two things change, the scenarios are different and the models are different, but it's still obvious that the, the range across models for one particular scenario is essentially the same. You try to correct for the scenario objective, and it, it's about the same. Of course, we have a low, low emission scenario here, which we didn't have before, but essentially the uncertainty has not decreased, despite an increase in computing of maybe a factor of 50 or so, and quite some probably low. Um, if you look at things locally, this is rainfall change by the end of the century. Um, and the way you have to read this map is that the dots here mean sort of high confidence, meaning the signal is strong and it's consistent across the model. Whereas sort of the hatching would mean the signal with within variability, and the white would mean the models are actually really inconsistent that they predict trends of opposite sign that are significant in individual models. But the point is that, first of all, um, they look the same. Right? Which one is which? And then anyone any guess, right? Unless you have actually read the papers, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Maybe that's good. <coughs> it's maybe that's good because that means that the basic processes in the, the, the large scale patterns are approximately robust and, and, and meaningful in those models. What is sort of less, less clear is that the number of dots here, stiffly here, has not changed. So that the area where we actually are confident about the changes has not increased over the name, over the, the generations of all. So we're still about, we still have about the same uncertainty as we had before. Now, when we were writing that paper, um, we wrote the final paragraph on how to interpret that, and basically asking the question, have we not made any progress? It was one of the more interesting cases where I think no single review comment was about the technical analysis. But there were loads and loads of comments from the reviewers about whether we had made any progress or not and how they should be phrased in a, in a high impact paper. So, and, and some saying that we do, of course, make progress. And anyway, I think my interpretation is that um, we may not have made, made progress in terms of reducing the range of the models predicted change, but we may have made progress in understanding why the models do it that way. And we are probably a bit more confident that we're capturing all the relevant processes um, for the fit. So in, in Rumsfeld's words, we, we may have converted some of the unknown unknowns into known unknowns because they included more things. 
the uncertainties may actually grow temporarily. And then you throw more data at the problem and you narrow it down again. And we may actually do that for a couple more in comparisons, that we include more things, which makes the model more realistic and more process-based, and then it, the uncertainty grows, and then if we have to shrink it again by model evaluation. So I do think we have made progress in the sense that our confidence is higher that this is the right result for the right reason. Even though for adaptation, um, we have not made any progress. So the question is really, um, how many models do we need and what sort of models do we need? And um, Gary was saying, well, we need all this complexity because nature is complex. And, and then that may be true, but sometimes I have, I have a sort of this sinking feeling that people are just building everything into the model in, because they can. And because of that sort of implicit but never written down assumption that as we do that, we will converge to reality. Um, it's just the <laughs> analogy. Um, if you build everything into the same model, it may not necessarily be useful. It may be very hard to interpret and to use. It may be very slow, even on the biggest computer. And, and it may be hard to understand why it fails. And it will fail in every computer, at least in some situations. So, conclusions and, and, and open questions. So, I'm not dismissing model results, so just to be clear. So I don't think the models are completely useless. Uh, I do think many of the large scale things that we project are actually quite robust and quite meaningful and we have relatively high confidence. Um, but there's a few things, and that's the really interesting things, and that's why I was talking about them, uh, that we need to think more. And one is that the models are getting better at the things we observe, but we're not getting better in reducing future spread. So th there's very clear indications that some things are improving in the things we can observe, but if you look at even the most aggregate quantities of climate sensitivity, uh, the models are still using a wide range. Models are always wrong, they can only be adequate for purpose, but the question is what is adequate? How do we find those criteria and what is the purpose? And I think that is sort of often not asked. Model performance varies, but it's hard to translate that into, into weights. I do argue that for some questions, some models may be more useful than others, but the community has had difficulties in coming up with ways, both technically <coughs> and sort of sociologically, to do that. Um, there's still, there's still sort of a lot of resistance to, to try to say, okay, we need a subset of models that do things credibly. Um, interestingly, if a modeling center develops a new model, they're going to trash the old model immediately. Right? So they seem to have some criteria of deciding that the new model is better than the old model. But when it comes to deciding whether model A is better than model B across centers, no one is going to even say something about that. Model sampling is neither systematic nor random. So this ensemble of opportunity that everyone sends whatever model results they have, I think it's nice because you have a broad sample, but it's hard to understand. And we need to have ways to take that into account. So the models are not independent. They share code, they share ideas, and then the actual number of models that we have, independent models may be more like five or 10, but certainly not 50. And certainly we shouldn't have any more confidence in a projection just because, because we have more models. Model spread is not an uncertainty. Um, it turns out that in, even in IPCC, model spread is often taken as sort of a proxy for uncertainty because we have nothing else to work with. And we're not smart enough. But um, it's not necessarily clear that the model spread is, is, is of any use. It could be too narrow because we're missing certain things, but it could also be too big. I think that was a question at some point from, from Gregor online. Um, I don't think model spread is necessarily the, the lower one of uncertainty. In some cases, you can exclude some of the models on the, uh, on the outside. <coughs> so um, spread may be smaller or it may be. A natural variability could be put sort of an irreducible limit uh, on model evaluation and uncertainty quantification. And maybe the open questions. Um, um, the question is, what do we actually want to know? Um, do we, do we really believe that there's one model for all purposes? And how many models do we need for the same purpose? And how should, if different should they be? 
Does it make sense for a center to submit three versions of almost the same model to involve the comparison? Or would we rather say, well, submit only one, or submit three versions that are actually different, as different as you can make them to learn from? And that relates to the way these different comparisons are done, and I have you illustrated with Linda and others. Um, we designed the model, we built the model, and we run it, and we even run the comparison. Then we ask a question. We try to say, oh, what question could we ask with the data that we have? Well, shouldn't the scientific method be the other way around and say, let's ask the question first, and then decide what model to use and what ensemble to use? Of course, that's somewhat impractical to build a new model for every question. I see that point. But still, I, my criticism of those model inter comparisons is that we do them without really carefully thinking of what we're trying to do. And I think CDF6 is no, it's no different from the previous ones. We had to submit a proposal for the next scenarios last month. So we haven't even published the fifth assessment report. We already have a plan for the next inter comparison even though very few people have actually thought hard about data that we have and what worked well, and maybe we could make it much smarter and res uh, allocate our resources a bit better, but it would require a bit more thinking rather than rushing into the next into comparison, which maybe it's unavoidable for um, political and financial reasons, um, but it's scientifically it's not great. And I think the, the thing that maybe this community could um, contribute and engage with is the question of what constitutes a good model, how do we establish confidence, and where is a model adequate? And, and I, I like the way Wendy works on these topics, and maybe there's more philosophers that would be interested in those questions. Thank you very much. Well, there's literally thousands of papers are being written on those uh, data sets for those model comparisons. But sometimes it's really hard because um, if you do one of those future scenarios, so you, you change everything at the same time. So you change all the atmospheric constituents at the same time. And, and the models are different in each and every respect. So they differ in physics, in carbon cycles, in oceans. And, and it's, of course, they will diverge, but it's really hard to sort of um, understand why they differ. And sometimes you can only answer those questions by actually taking the models and running them in a much, much simpler case, or maybe taking parts of the model and then sort of digging down on what the reason is. Okay. There's so many things happening at the same time that, that is, often these things are completely uncorrelated with everything. Right? So all of these emerging constraints are essentially clouds and points that are hard to interpret. But, but when you yeah, just like you have exam like you have those the graph where you have the different the models in the same family that had some differences. Yeah. And so that would be where you could maybe wouldn't those be <coughs> are those, are some of those ones where you would have an opportunity to, to isolate differences and see how things are similar? Maybe in some cases, um yeah. But again, it's it's uh, because everything is different. It's hard to no, it's, it's hard to come to sort of very clear conclusions without actually taking the model apart and, and looking at different <coughs> bits and pieces in, in, in isolation and maybe in, in much simpler experiments. Yeah, the next. Uh, so uh, I mean, contrary to uh, to uh, perhaps popular assumption, uh, the modeling groups do actually think about what they're doing when they create models. <laughs> 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 and, and they mostly create models for their own purposes, right? And I mean, we just had this, we just had this big discussion with our funders, and then and they were saying, well, you know, you're spending so much time on this CMIP stuff, like, uh, why aren't you actually pursuing the, the scientific questions that, that we're actually paying you to be, to be looking at, right? So why are you wasting your time with CMIP? Um, and, uh, and in my quite 
strong and, and voluminous uh, response, I, the, the point I tried to make was we use CMIP and the deadlines and the experimental <coughs> protocols uh, to do the science that we want to do. Now, we don't do all of the experiments because some of them are not interesting to us, so we don't have the expertise, and, and that's the that questions that we don't want to do. But we do spend a lot of time, and we, we were one of the groups that put in six different configurations, all of which were kind of deltas on a theme, right? And they all kind of grouped together compared to other models. But we were interested in the questions about what difference does it make if you have fully interactive atmospheric chemistry? What difference does it make if you have one model versus another model? Those were questions that we internally generated and used CMIP as a kind of springboard and a framework for us to do that in a way that might be useful to other people as well. Right? Now, we also did a huge number of single forcing runs with multiple uh, ensemble members uh, that nobody else uh, even touched. And so we put in something like 250 different runs. Now, we would have done those internally, but we put them in the CMIP 5 archive because sometimes other people want to look at those things as well. So we use CMIP 5 in order to help us like, kind of frame the science that we want to do and the questions that we want to ask. Now, I'm pretty sure all the other groups do something very similar, perhaps with the exception of NCAR because they feel that they have to do everything uh, for, for everybody. Um, but most of the other groups are very selective about what they do based on their own internal questions. Now, and the question that you really want is, well, as, as, a, as, as somebody downstream of CMIP, what should we make of that? Okay, now that's a much more interesting question. And then, you know, I think all of those kind of questions, that, that when you're analyzing, make a lot more sense. I, I don't disagree. I think the, the point is, is, so you're saying you built a model for your own scientific questions, and everyone else builds their own model for their own scientific questions, which may be different questions. So you end up with 50 different models for 50 scientific questions, and they're all scientific questions, and then you're using, you're using the results for policy or for adaptation. So maybe the point is that if we want to do impact and adaptation, maybe the criteria for building a model and an ensemble should be different than they are for your internal research questions. It's not obvious to me that one model can satisfy all of these things at the same time. Robert? Yeah, so let me come in for it as a model land. And well, you know, I, I, I really like the structure of your talk and, and a lot of specifics. I, I, I do find it sort of very self-referential to the climate models. It's actually, I think, goes to your, your question. So, you know, um, thanks for showing my slide, and it's great. And the, but the reason that we chose those was not on your list. It was because it, the, the, the client essentially had been using those previously, and it's sort of a pain to wire them up into their very complicated models, and they were comfortable with those. So there wasn't a cost in changing, and there was no strong evidence that those would give us a different stress case for the client. So the client is important, but it's not clear that a different set would be different. So just to give you another example, we're just sort of, we went, just have gone through a huge model selection process, but with a completely different set of criteria. Just to give you a feel of what it looks like, we question, for the World Bank, they've got big investment projects in hydropower in Africa. The question is, does climate change change the investment projects? They run all the CMIP, CMIP 3, all the CMIP 5 ensembles, a couple of them, that's going to have this huge sea of climate models. And then we need to choose six projections that we can optimize what a World Bank investment portfolio would look like. And so the criteria are, there's seven river basins, we want to get uh, at, have at least one sample of an extreme and a middle for each basin, and so we you know, look at all the combinations of six, get all the ones that get an extreme and middle and uh, you know, high-low and for precipitation, actually CMI, for each of them, and then we weight them on how many uh, uh, extremes they get across basins, because that's important for the virtue of you know, shifting power between different regions. So it has nothing to do with the quality of the models. We're interested in a stressing sample for the World Bank investment plans. Now, it would be really interesting to then fold into that criteria some you know, judgment about whether the correlations between basins, which is really getting at, is important. But I, just, I, I give you the example, and you can comment if you like, but, but just how the criteria we're trying to select good models, but the criteria is totally different and it has nothing to do with the models per se, but has different, it's all entirely focused 
on what it can tell us about where the World Bank should be investing its money? I think this is a good example where probably some thought has gone into the selection of models, but my worry is that this is the exception. Uh, yeah, and, and, and most people just use whatever model is out there and, and just process it because it's there. So, so in most cases, the evaluation is not done or people do not carefully think of what the criteria may be. And in your case, you say it's not, a, it's not actually what the model performance is, it may be something else, but at least you need to think about how to use those sets of models. Because some are good and some are bad, and definitely this ensemble is not representative of anything um, in the way they distribute it. And we don't know how to deal with that. And I think it's actually getting worse. It's getting worse because it's easier to share code and infrastructure, so it's easier to download an NCAR model than ever and, and just adapt it and, 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 sh and, and switch parts, which is fine scientifically, as long as you make it transparent and as long as you take it into account in, in the interpretation. Um, final prediction has been 200,000 versions of HAT CM3, I and mean, had we had those in those figures, then there would be a, a cloud of 200,000 somewhere. <laughs> like, how do you take that into account? Um, or there could be someone taking a model, fake the NCAR model, because it's free and open. You can run it on a laptop, and you can say, I parameterize the effect of God, and God says there is no effect of CO2, so it has no warming. Right? Um, it could happen. You only have a model without warming. Uh, and then what do you do? I mean, what are the criteria to say this model makes no sense? Should it happen, or, or should we not do that? I mean, the, there's other questions related to conservation of energy, conservation of water. There are some models that lose like 10% of the water. Um, should we worry about that? Maybe we should. Right now, 
And so the relevancy relationship was really, really obvious. But it might be worth really digging into how complicated these relevancy relationships can get. So take cases where you're doing things like um, parameterization, or you're using paleo data, or you're converting from subcomponents. There, notice that the relevancy is sort of a two-step, right? I've got my observation. Now, I've got to show that this observation is relevant to that subcomponent, say. I know that the subcomponent has a certain skill. But then there's the second relevancy step, right? Which is, okay, now I know that we can do this. What on earth does that have to do with what I actually want the model to do overall? Okay. So a lot of the time, uh, this is this very thing you say. Um, I just think that if there's something I would add to your kind of um, little sort of philosophical paragraph, it would be to dig in a little bit more because it seems like those relevancy relations are usually sort of two-step, right? Especially when you're doing something Okay, I'll uh, think about my paragraph again and maybe make it more complicated. <laughs> 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 I, I think you're fine. Add some errors. Okay, thank you. Yeah, 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 thank you. So this is Sean uh, Gregor. Um, it is a three part article. He says, um, he says, thanks. That was a very clear reflection. Uh, my question concerns MME interpretation. What gives us reason to think that individual models are sampled systematically or unsystematically from the entire space of all possible models? Why should weights help here? And what is that space of all possible models in? <laughs> That's a hard question. I mean, we don't know what the space of all possible models is. And we certainly know that we're not sampling the space of all possible models because many things are similarly wrong or similarly simplified in all of those models. I, I think the challenge is, that from a practical point of view, is how do we make sense of the space of models that we have? So if you think about that spider web thing, uh, we have the models that we have and we try to make sense of them. So my, just gonna, go ahead and get slide again. So we have the space of models. Um, and we think there are some models that are probably redundant, like some of those blue ones here. There's probably a space out there here on, 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 the, on the top of the page and sort of on the sample, right? So there may be some good models out there that we haven't, or maybe here, that will still be close to observations that we haven't, haven't sampled. I think the arguments for weights is that if you, if you put in a model of weeds into CMIP5, then, then you should make a case that this is probably not a very relevant model for the types of uh, things you want to know. So that at least at some limit, there is a point where you say this model is completely out of anything and we shouldn't really believe it. Now, how exactly you determine those weights is hard because you don't quite know what the criteria should be for, for inferring skills. So how, how does the things you can observe relate to the things in the future? But say, Say this one model here, this is F Bolster, the previous model in CMU3, it's it's bad about on just about anything. Right? So there's probably a reason to say, well, maybe we don't trust that model too much because weird things are going on in that model. It becomes maybe less clear once you get closer. But the, the conceptually the idea would be if you if you're closer to the observations today, that's not a sufficient thing, but it's probably some sort of necessary condition. To, to, to think that the models are doing the right thing. And if you do a sub, if you, maybe another thought is if you have a lot of models and you wait by something that is not relevant, then it shouldn't change the answer. You don't, it only becomes a problem if you have very few models. But if you have hundreds of models and you wait by some random number, then it's not going to change the answer. So there's not really much harm you can do in a large sample. Kevin, I think another question. But it, it, it is a great thing that has several years on this year. Back there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate your pixelated clouds, I'm sure. And uh, I want to refer to the, right before that, you talked about the argument of process understanding. And your third point was that no part of our, our interaction would be known or unknown would be missing. Uh, so, uh, relating that back to Jenny's point about uh, Dalton. Uh, his model it had a gravitational at age of the, of, the, of the universe based on his understanding of the sun at the time. So instead of citing your own field or somebody from another field, uh, if you look at Calvin, if you look at Charles Lyell, 
you would get a different interpretation of actualism based on known processes. So how can you know that an unknown is missing? And, and back to the clouds, I mean, perhaps the clouds now, you know, there's new information about the microphysical processes, there, there are pollutants in them, or even some microbes that are coming into meteorology. And so some of the unknowns are coming back in, or they're getting to be known, but, but you can't predict the, the future unknowns. And I think that would be an example. Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, fundamentally, we have no way of knowing the unknown unknowns. I think maybe the argument would be if, if your model, with all your best knowledge, does not replicate the things you observe, then there may be evidence for unknown unknowns that you haven't considered. If your model matches the things you observe, then maybe the chances that the chances are smaller for unknown unknown. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that the universe. How can you observe the uh, the hundred year forecast? Would be beyond your lifetime. How, how do you observe that? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I think uh, my point is we, we, we should, based on our scientific understanding, we should say we don't know anything that we could think of, at least now, that are, is probably terribly off. And, and I, in the climate case, there are things we know that are, we are missing. For instance, the methane hydrates, the permafrost, the melting of Greenland is not in those models. But, but other than that, I, I can't think of anything that would make the forecast go off by a factor of 10. So it could be off by a factor of 2. And that's sort of the scaling that we do. And we, we, we say, well, it could be outside. But we, we, it, I personally think it's, it's unlikely that it would be off by a factor of 10. But of course, fundamentally, I don't know. I can't prove it. I'm afraid we have time for only one more question. We do want to give time to break. So apologies to everyone else who had their hand up. I mean, I just, I just wanted to quickly first follow up on the unknown unknown thing. I mean, I think I agree with, 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 what, with what Rachel was saying, because we can have clues that we're in a situation where the chance of unknown unknowns is not low. <laughs> that, you know, we can, we, you're right, we can never say, we never be in a position to say, I'm certain there are no more unknown unknowns that are going to come in. But you can be in a different kind of epistemic situation where you have lots of clues that uh, you may, that the chance is not low that you're missing something. And so, but my real question is just a, a science question. I was really intrigued when you were um, talking about the internal variability simulations and the big spread that was seen over 50 years that the Nessar uh, work in. And you said that you thought that that wasn't going to go away. And I was kind of curious about um, how you, the grounds for saying that. Like, um, is it that you can understand well enough the kinds of, you know, changes in flow pattern or something that are underlying those that kind of spread that you can sort of foresee that whatever improvements you made to your model, that that kind of sensitivity was still going to be there. Um, I just wanted to understand that um, that claim a little bit better. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying it well. But. So the, the natural variability is is essentially chaos, right? Yeah. It's essentially weather on a time scale of <coughs> 50 years or so. So the I don't see how you could get away from that, except if you're able to predict those things. Right? And so there's predictability on time scales of a few days for whether there may be some predictability on the interannual time scale. But so far, we, we don't get beyond like two years, sometimes even less. Um, so unless there is some sort of memory in the ocean where you could say, OK, that, that helps us to sort of get the first few years right. But, um, whether there's an end, a lineo or not in 30 years from now, I mean, there's absolutely no hope that we would ever be able to predict. So I think we should consider that as sort of a, a long-term trend, which we can simulate and we can predict based on external forcing. And then some, some sort of noise superimposed onto that. And to first order, that noise is probably similar as it is today. So I don't know whether that answers your question. I, I think we should not misinterpret that thing. In, in that we can't say anything because this is only relevant if you look local because it's essentially atmospheric flow. But once you start aggregating, and I haven't shown that, once you start aggregating over space, um, things actually become much, much more clear. Right? So you may have cold in one area but then warm in the other area, but if you start aggregating, it's very clear. So for instance, if you do a distribution of heavy precipitation, you see that shifting within a decade or two very clearly, very significant. So 
So it, doesn't, it means you can't predict where the next heavy precipitation event is going to be. But you can be pretty sure that there will be one. So that the, if, you, if you work in a reinsurance company or if you have a sort of statewide or countrywide view where you have to pay for damages, then you will see very clear trend on aggregated things, even though you cannot predict the local thing. Or we, we made the analogy in the paper for, for, for the traffic. Um, if you have more traffic or higher speed limits, you will probably have more active accidents, so you need more ambulances, even though you will never be able to predict where the individual accident will be. Yeah, it was only because these were the, these were 50 year time frames, you know, 50 year kinds of changes that it, I thought maybe there might be a little more hope for, for uh, improving, but thanks, thanks for. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think so, but maybe we could talk over. Thank you very much. <laughs>